So it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, my long-term collaborator, Martina Huber from the physics department at Leiden University. And she did her PhD in chemistry with professors Merbius and Kurek at the Free University in Berlin. And afterwards a postdoc with the professor Vera in San Diego. And then she did habilitation in, uh, in Berlin in 1998. She joined Leiden University, where now she is an associate professor. So she's been in uh, the EPR field all her life and uh, never shied away from big challenges. For example, together with Edgar Gunes, he pioneered the J-band EPR spectroscopy. And she's also not been afraid to take on difficult biological systems, such as weak protein complexes, which are always uh, appear as mixtures of free and bound proteins and proteins with multiple orientations in the encounter complexes, which yields very complicated EPR signals. And in recent years, he's taken on uh, amyloid proteins, which also appear in monomers, oligomers, and fibrils all together. And that changes also our composition over time. So by clever deconvolution analysis, he's able to extract the required information. And in many years we've worked together, we often realized that even though NMR and EPR both deal with magnetic resonance, the language is very different. And it's important not to get lost in translation. But by bringing together these two, these two methods has, has uh, proven very fruitful for us and I can really recommend it to anyone. So I'm very happy to uh, introduce Martina here and I'm looking forward to her talk. Well, thanks a lot for this really nice uh, introduction, makes me blush. And um, also thank you very much uh, both for the invitation and the organizers for organizing this uh, lecture series because yeah, it's really been holding us together, albeit uh, virtually in the last yeah, couple of years. Um, so let me start sharing. And uh, so, yeah, so today I want to take the opportunity to talk about what we do about uh, amyloid interaction and uh, aggregation by electron paramagnetic resonance. So it's a kind of switch from um, yeah, what we've just heard. And also you will see the protein becomes a lot more simple than uh, what we've just seen. And most of what I'm going to describe actually uh, will be done on in relation to alpha synuclein. And so let me just give you a brief uh, introduction into this protein. Um, so it is a real protein and it was first discovered as the main component of the plugs that are found in uh, Parkinson's disease, so shaking paralysis. And this is a scan of a brain region and here you see these deposits. And that was the uh, source uh, where alpha synuclein was first found. And then it was discovered that it's actually a functional protein and uh, that it obviously has a physiological function. Now, what's uh, unique about this protein, and of course, there are many alpha synuclein specialists here, so I'm not talking uh, to them, but uh, let me just briefly review. So alpha synuclein is an intrinsically disordered protein that um, has uh, no or very little structure in solution, but that in uh, contact with other systems actually takes on structure and as we now know, is functional. And it's really amazing what has been discovered in the last time uh, period about what its functional aspects are, because we now know that it's not only in the brain, but, uh, or not only in the synaptic cleft, though it was uh, sort of the original idea. It also occurs in almost any organelle that um, we can think of, mitochondria, cell nucleus, endoplasmatic reticulum, if that tells you something. So in all these uh, environment, it interacts with other uh, partners. And so it has interactions with other proteins, of course. Membranes are very important for the mitochondria and uh, the brain uh, synaptic reaction. But also it seems to interact with DNA, maybe has something to do there. And uh, well, then the endoplasmatic reticulum. So the first question is, what is its functional role? And then the second is, of course, because it's involved in the shaking paralysis and other neurodegenerative diseases, which of these functions are disease related? So um, what 
where, where it could play a role would be oxidative stress, membrane damage, misfolding, and of course the self-aggregation that is sort of the hallmark of the disease. Um, so let's uh, take a look at what we're going to discuss today. I want to focus a little bit on the membrane interaction of alpha synuclein and then in the second part to talk about the self-aggregation of amyloids. Of course, we all realize that uh, alpha synuclein does not contain unpaired electrons. And if we want to do um, uh, electron paramagnetic resonance, then we need unpaired electrons. And so I'm going to talk about nitroxide spin labels and they can be introduced at a position of interest by site-directed mutagenesis and then attaching to this nitroxide spin labels. So at least we can put in our probe and we can make basically this molecule spy for us for what the protein is doing. So let's take a brief look at the sort of well-known energy level scheme that we're going to deal with and uh, just the obvious uh, difference is, of course, that the magnetic moment of the electron is significantly larger than that of the nucleus that we're used to. In the nitroxide, we have an unpaired electron that's delocalized over nitrogen and oxygen, and therefore we have a hyperfine interaction with the nitrogen nucleus, which is an I equals one nucleus, and so that causes a three-line spectrum, and then we do EPR, at least until the, the part that I'm discussing here, in continuous wave and we sweep the magnetic field and to make your life even more complicated, we detect the first derivative of the signal. So you see these funny line shapes here. And uh, one of the things that uh, we're uh, interested in is also, of course, increasing the resolution. And one of the ways to increase the resolution is to go, as you know, to higher fields. And so typical EPR spectra are done at nine gigahertz, 0.3 Tesla, a 14 megahertz NMR spectrometer. Um, furthermore, we have uh, 10 times higher frequencies. And uh, in Leiden, we also have the possibility to have this uh, uh, 30 times higher frequency, because this is one of the, uh, yeah, uh, one of the features of our group. So we design instrumentation and also in particular to go to high field EPR. And the spectrometer we have here is laboratory developed. It uh, operates at 275 gigahertz and it has a uh, very high sensitivity uh, also compared to other systems and just to highlight. So the sample actually goes into a resonator that's hidden inside here and we have nanoliters of samples in these experiments. So what is the advantage of going to high fields for nitroxides? Well, we can directly see the anisotropy of some of our interactions. And uh, the anisotropy means that if a nitroxide is oriented like this resp with respect to the magnetic field, then its absorption would occur in the low frequency region. If it's oriented perpendicular to that, its resonance would occur at this particular point. But anyway, most relevant is uh, that the interactions are anisotropic because that's the observable that we're going to use to in, uh, in our investigation. So if all the molecules are in a frozen solution. So all the nitroxides are solidly, uh, are in a solid state or rotating very slowly. Then we see this powder pattern. Now, as the molecule starts rotating, we see a partial averaging of these orientations. And then we go to the motionally narrowed situation that you see up here. So all this should be roughly familiar. We're trying to uh, still communicate. I was going to talk about the membrane interaction of alpha synuclein. So let's uh, take a look at what is known about this. So we have membranes. We've also heard membranes uh, in uh, the previous talk of Gerd Wagner. So we have membranes. Of course, they're made up of lipids. 
And the thing about alpha synuclein is that it actually binds to the membrane surface. So we have the membrane surface and it binds as an amphiphatic helix on that surface. Bit unusual. And it also has uh, an alpha helical region that spans uh, residue one to about 100 and uh, a peculiar uh, charge pattern. So this is what was known. And uh, how do we use ETR to learn more about this? Well, here I'm just showing a cartoon basically. So if our protein is not bound to anything and uh, uh, then we would have a highly mobile spectrum. So this would be the blue spectrum shown here, narrow lines. And if the part of the protein that the spin label is attached to binds to something, for example, a vesicle, then uh, the motion would slow down and we would observe this uh, broader spectrum that you can nicely see here in the high field line. So that's the observable that we're going to use. And one thing that we did uh, was to take a look at uh, how membrane charge affects the binding. And so this is my cartoon of the alpha synuclein here. So this is the membrane binding part and this is the uh, C-terminus. And uh, so what we did is we investigated spin labels at different positions. And the observable or the, the observation was that if a spin label is attached to this part of the protein, it actually lets go of the membrane at lower at higher charge density than the other end of the alpha helix, where we see that the letting go actually occurs at a charge density that's much lower. So we detect differential binding by um, using this technique. Now, of course, we wanted to go to more uh, natural membranes. Um, this was a, a very, very simple lipid, so to speak. And um, so one example is, well, how do nerve cells talk to each other? So we have a nerve cell that's transmitting and a nerve cell that's receiving, and the action happens at the synapse, where the neurotransmitter is actually uh, encapsulated in the vesicle and then released to the outside membrane of the, um, of the transmitting neuron to be taken up on the receiving side. And here we were interested in the membrane that encapsulates the, uh, uh, the neuron and that's the neuronal plasma membrane. The second part we looked at was uh, the mitochondrion, so that's the energy uh, power plant of the cell. And uh, so this is an organelle of the cell. And here we looked in particular at the inner mitochondrial membrane. So what did we see? Um, what we saw was a bit surprising was that when we look at two residues that you see are quite close to this end of the helix that was letting go, at, at relatively low charge, high charge density, um, we see that the lines are pretty broad. So these are the two positions at the uh, mitochondrial membrane and the neural membrane. The lines are broad, indicating that there's still good binding. And that is surprising because those natural membranes are actually charged a lot less than the examples that we've seen. So, our observation is that the alpha synuclein really has a specific interaction, or in other words, the surface of such a natural membrane is really different from our model membranes. And there seems to be something that makes the alpha synuclein specifically interact with it. Um, we also, of course, do deer and measure distances. So we were also able to show that uh, the alpha synuclein then binds with a different conformation than we've seen in other cases. Um, but uh, the take home message here is that um, evidently there are natural membranes and they have specific properties and or the other way around alpha synuclein um, uh, sequence must encode something that enables it to specifically interact with these uh, specific membranes. So, so much for the membrane interaction. And then we come to the uh, second 
yeah, sort of um, fascinating thing about amyloid proteins. And this is the fact that if um, under certain conditions, these very much uh, disordered spaghetti-like uh, proteins can take on a very well-ordered beta sheet structure. And those are the, uh, the central part of the deposits in the brain. So an electron micrograph shows us these long and uh, these long fibrils that have a well-defined width. So it's a nicely ordered uh, structure. And um, the question is now what is happening in between? So um, how do we get from spaghetti to ordered? And so if we look at a plot of um, one of the fibril markers, the thioflavin T in this case, then the typical observation is that over time, first you don't see anything, and then you see a, a fibril signal appearing. And of course, everything that's interesting must happen here where we can't see it. And so it was, uh, the question is, can we use EPR to get something here? And that would be to address this terra incognita, which is the intermediate of this alpha synuclein aggregation and its mechanism. You know, we make use of the fact, well, essentially the method I've been explaining, but um, we look at the fact that a small particle would have a fast rotation and the bigger the particles become, we expect to see more slow rotation. So um, there was one more thing that we had to take into account, um, you know, call it a feature, call it a bug. The spin label I've been talking about before is actually quite loosely attached to the protein backbone, which is nice for some things. But in our particular case, it, it could mask some of the um, yeah, some of the aggregation. And so we went to a different type of spin label where the spin label is now directly linked to the protein backbone. To make our life even more easy, uh, we went to, an, uh, to a particular uh, shorter sequence that was uh, basically described by the Eisenberg group, which has the advantage that it uh, seems to arrest in an intermediate oligomer state rather than going through to the fibril very fast. So that would make our experiment um, more uh, likely to succeed. Now, and uh, lo and behold, so when, uh, when you look at this low frequency uh, spectrum here, the standard EPR spectrometer, then well, it takes uh, a bachelor, a really talented bachelor student like Ireitz, um, to actually see that something is happening here. But when we go to 95 gigahertz, you probably believe me more easily that there is really a broadening visible. And so that was really a crucial effect here. And then we do spectral analysis to get uh, some idea of what's going on. So we see this red feature here which we attribute to monomer because it's fast rotating. Then we see an intermediate uh, fraction shown in green here. And uh, then we see this light blue fraction that is a slower rotating uh, state. And adding all of them up to the dark blue curve, we see that the simulation of the experimental spectrum is uh, satisfactory. And very recently, um, we've also shown that uh, we can do a similar experiment with the alpha synuclein and also here see the development of aggregation in situ. Now, this brings me to the end. Um, we've shown, I've shown you membrane binding and how we can determine membrane binding with residue specificity. specificity and, uh, well, that uh, we have a tool by which we can get more information on the intermediates of aggregation. Um, of course, you know that EPR can measure these, you know, very powerful nanometer distance constraints. Um, so I haven't talked about them. 
but uh, what I want to bring across is that we can really get the interactions of intrinsically disordered proteins where we're not limited to any size of the partners. So any one of the partners that I've been mentioning um, in principle can be targeted. This is done at room temperature and actually in situ, so wild things happen. So with this, uh, yeah, we think we are well equipped to get into this terra incognita of uh, intrinsically disordered proteins. And uh, I mean, my group is really small. Current members are uh, Leonardo Passerini um, and uh, PhD student, Lionel Ndamba, who's doing the uh, biochemistry. Jackie actually works on the iron side of alpha of uh, um, Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative disease, former group members. And uh, of course, none of this would have been possible because we really design instrumentation without the machine shop and uh, the technicians who are, and especially the technicians, Jos Düsseldorf and Carmen von der Meer, Edgar Tolnen and Jan Schmidt, if we go back. So this is the Leiden EPR and I thank you for uh, listening. Thanks a lot, um, Martina. I think it's proved my point of really difficult systems that you take on. Um, maybe I can start with a, a question. So with these oligo oligomer analysis that you just shown, you see these three species, like medium, uh, small, medium, large. Does that mean that the oligomers are actually indeed of very well-defined sizes or can they be monomer, dimer, trimer, et cetera? Uh, that's a very interesting question, and of course, if 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 we look at uh, uh, what we're seeing here, then uh, I guess you can imagine that there could be some spread clearly in those uh, in those components. And um, we've actually done uh, tried to look at that question, and we think that especially in the high field method, uh, we could be able to really detect individual numbers of oligomers when you look here, but we are certainly not yet there. Hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Could I ask a follow-up question uh, to, to this one? Uh, um, um, were, were these um, oligomers uh, done in the presence of membranes or was this aggregation just in water? Uh, this is aggregation in, in, in water. In water, okay, okay. So, so all the second part was done without membranes present. Christian, I remember you were developing a compound to prevent oligomer formation, right? Or something. What's the situation there? Well, uh, is it something that, that Martina can test uh, on her samples? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, uh, that, that would, be, would be great. I mean, we are... We are, um, with this compound, we are now in the clinic um, and uh, we are trying also, of course, to de determine um, structures uh, with, with it. And um, um, yeah, that it's, I mean, we, we are trying with NMR more or less the same, characterizing these um, early aggregates actually uh, in, the, in the membranes. I mean, we just published a paper last year on, on, on that. And uh, so, so that's, um, I mean, very similar. Um, approach we, we we try by NMR with the of course then getting really high resolution I mean as high as possible resolution structures there. Could, could I ask another question um, that, uh, on the first part with the monomer? I mean, in principle, uh, I could imagine that if you go around a helix, you should see um, different uh, mobility changes with the MTSL spin label. So is, did, did, you, uh, did you do that um, in, in order to see whether what, what's the characteristic of a helix bound to a membrane um, seen by MTSL spin labeling? Um, we have not done that. We, in the meantime, we looked at uh, probably in total 20 residues, but not systematically about the membrane location. There are models of the membrane um, of the membrane position, like where the um, like which part is uh, probably in contact uh, with the membrane. And for most of the mutants that we 
decided to work with, we looked at positions that would not really incorporate into the membrane just to avoid uh, interference. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's been work from uh, Ralf Langen's group who has really been uh, first characterizing this uh, amphiphatic helix state and they investigated a lot, a lot more of these mutants. Okay, there's a few more questions. So first, uh, as Mark. Yeah. Uh, how do you manage the heat dissipation of aqueous samples at uh, high fields that you use? Ah. That's a very specialized question. Um, in, uh, in principle, I think the problem is, is not as severe as an NMR where your solution composition is much more critical. Um, the main um, answer is uh, to, to use uh, thinner capillaries. So, and with that, we, we, we can work it out because it's not, really the heat problem, but it's basically that the dielectric absorption is uh, reducing our, our cavity cue and that we can avoid by going through to sufficiently thin capillaries. But yeah, that's uh, what you already- Even at 275 gigahertz, that's still you know, feasible. Well, you already at x -band, you have troubles when you work with liquids, I mean with aqueous liquids, and so uh, I'm amazed that this works at all. Yeah, it takes some, it takes some, um, some trials, but in principle, yeah, we were able, people thought that at 95 gigahertz you couldn't measure aqueous samples that uh, proved to be well, I'm not saying easily possible. Uh, the trick is to have a uh, thin enough capillary, but also to make sure that it's really nicely centered. And as long as you can get that, sometimes we use tubes and tubes and things like that. So, so it's really doable. And I guess I was indeed surprised that at 275 gigahertz, it turned out to be so easy. But that's of course, because... Uh, people had already figured out different sizes, uh, tubings. Is there still time to answer two questions from the audience? Yeah. So shall I read them out or can you read them yourself also? Um, I don't have the chat open right okay. now. I, it looks like modeling. So this is Oleg Anzukin. Uh, it looks like modeling. Uh, of the high field wing in the spectra is somewhat more problematic, right? You had this zoom in, yeah, it's still on the, on the screen. The zoom in and then the high field is a bit uh, difficult. Could you possibly comment on that? Why is this so? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, this is of course a hugely blown up spectrum. So that also of course blows up the um, discrepancies. I think um, it's, it's, yeah, it, it's, there are different possibilities. We have now um, actually simulated everything with an isotropic rotation, but at high field, we also have the possibility to include an isotropic rotation, only we really don't have the resolution here to do that. So by improving our um, components, I think we could do better. But um, if you look at the full scale, then it doesn't look as bad as it does here. Okay, Ulrich Lepage asks, uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, do you systematically use fluorescent reporters of aggregation in the preparation of your samples? It has been reported that upon injection in vivo or lab-grown fibrils, the most toxic oligomer samples were those that had uh, showed little or to no uh, thioflavin T Congo red signal during growth. Similar, those also had a very strong fibrillation as reported from EM. Yeah, so we um, we regularly track um, usually tyro T fluorescence while we take our EPR samples. I think I'm I'm showing it here in the next slide. Um, so we regularly do tyro T fluorescence to detect uh, fibrils um, at the same time as as we take out EPR samples, and that's an important control. 
the i mean the giveaway is of course that we see these uh, oligomers appearing before the tio t fluorescence sets in and that's a good sign that it's really an intermediate and not a beginning fibril and marcus had his hand up but it's down again do you still want to ask a question yeah i can ask and then i can close the session as i did so, right. uh, yeah my question was a little bit i mean you commented on this uh that the structure uh, is measured by deer or probed by deer in this sort of mitochondria or, or so membranes was different from i guess other deer measurements which have been done by maybe Eliza and other people i guess so so what are the differences really yeah what we see is um uh that's shown right here um so that's basically the result so so what we see is that um this very for the specialist sorry so so this very tight horseshoe structure that we see in 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 on the model membranes um that doesn't occur and uh what what we see is actually rather a yeah more extended or a superposition of of broader um helical forms so that's in a nutshell what we see here. 